Coming up on Unpacked. I was 17 and she mm. was like 22. She was like, no, there's a braai in Germiston. Do you want to come with? I get offered orange juice. At this time, I haven't started drinking. And that's the last thing I remember. Waking up and I'm staring at the sky and it's dark. So I was only wearing a top mm. and nothing at the bottom. Mm. And I was just covered in blood. She was gang raped as a teenager, but has survived and is here to share her story. Let's unpack. Just like any 17-year-old, Sally Dumisa was thrilled when she was granted permission to go to a braai with one of her friends. Having shared a ride with others headed to the same location, she did not know what would transpire from this drive. 18 years later, she is here. This is part one of her story. Let's unpack. Sally, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So take us back to that fateful day and what were the events leading up to what happened? Um, sure. Okay. Um, the, a, a friend, I'll say a friend at that time, mm. was a friend of my sister's and she befriended me, mm. a little older than me, um, by a couple of, by three years. And she said I was a really nice person and she wanted to be my friend. And our friendship started like that. And then and you guys were how old at the time? I was 17 and she mm. was like 22. So you're still school going age. I'm still school, go yes. school going age and she isn't. And she was like, I'm a really nice person to hang around with. So she befriended me and stopped being friends with my sister and she became friends with me. Mm. And, and she said the one time, look, have you ever been to a party or a bride? At that time, I was a slow developer. I mean... Mm. Partying wasn't something that was on my mind. Mm. Um, and she was like, no, there's a braai in Germiston. Do you want to come with? It's going to be a couple of friends. And I mean, I'm like, it's a braai. Sure, why not? Mm. You're older than me. It's going to be okay. Um, at that time, my mom was tra traveling uh, around the world because she was a nurse. Mm. So my care guardian was my sister. Mm. So I said to my sister, I'm going to this braai with such a person. And she was like, it's completely fine because she knows her. Mm. The arrangements were I was going to go to her house and from there we were going to get picked up and then go to the braai. Mm. I got to her house. I mean, I was so excited. This is literally like my first sort of like outdoor function. Mm. Excited, went and bought an, a, like a little outfit for the braai, went to her house, met her there, we changed, got ready. Um, then they came to pick us up. Um, when they picked us up, it was a combi. In the combi, there were five guys, me and her. So were these supposedly like people she knew? Yeah, she, they knew her. So it was people who she knew. Yeah. There was nothing odd about five guys being in a combi. You were feeling safe and everything was okay. Honestly speaking, at that time, my mind didn't even, I mean, it's literally being naive Mm. my whole safety net was I'm traveling with somebody that I know, mm. that my sister knows. There's nothing to worry about. Yes. So even getting into the kumbi and there's like five guys and we're the only girls doesn't raise any alarms to me mm. at that point. And the conversation is we're still going to go pick up other people on the way. Yes. So I'm not stressed. Yes, yes. We get in the kumbi, I get offered orange juice. At this time, I haven't started drinking. Mm. And that's the last thing I remember. So literally straight up, somebody offered you orange juice. And can you recall for me, you know, what ages the guys seemed like they were and what maybe the conversation was in the car? So out of the five guys, two I know mm. in the sense when I say no, I've seen them in my area. Mm. It's the kind of guys maybe if I get off the bus stop from school, I'd see them at the corner, I'd see them, you know. Mm. Uh, Age-wise, they were her age, mm. 20 something, early mm. 20s. Yeah. Mm. I would mm. say, yeah. And what was the conversation like when you got in the in the vehicle? There wasn't much of a conversation with me. Um mm. outside of the fact that I think just before we lay, like just before we got in the kumbi, the the one guy's like, oh, it's finally cool to hang out with you, something along those mm. lines. Yeah. Mm. But th mm. there wasn't any conversation with me, mm. but they were all having a chat and 
And what was the plan going to be that you are all going to the same party? The, the, the uh, Bri. The same Bri, yes. So the plan was apparently we we're going to leave there. We were the last people. We were being picked up and then going to pick up other people on the way. Hmm. And then we're going to go to the Bri. And then after the Bri, come back, get dropped drop off at her place. Mm. And then she would take me home, walk me home because she lived like maybe three, four streets away from my house. Mm. Mm. So they offer you orange juice and uh, that's the last thing that you remember. What is the next thing that you recall? Waking up and I'm staring at the sky and it's dark Mm. and my head hurts. Mm. And my first thought is like, where's my friend? Or where's the person I came with? Mm. And then the second thought was, where am I? Mm. Um, I remember stretching my hands because I was lying on my back, Mm. stretching my hands, trying to feel, because my head hurts. I couldn't lift my head to sort of look around. Mm. So I stretched my hands to feel where I am. And obviously, as I looked around, I could see the sky feeling around. I'm like, okay, this this is grass felt like. Mm. And I tried to listen. I couldn't hear anything. I couldn't hear cars. I couldn't hear nothing. Mm. And then I think at that moment, fear hit me. Like, I just got scared. Mm. I was like, I know something terrible has happened, Mm. but I don't want my sister finding me like this. Mm. So the next thing is I just started pushing myself with my hands to, I don't know where I was going, but I was like, let me just move because if I stay here, I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Was there anything at that time that was familiar? Mm. Mm. At, at, at that moment, I don't want to lie to you. Besides confusion and fear, nothing. I just, the only thing I could hear is just like crickets and looking into the sky and seeing pitch black. Mm. Mm. And the confusion is like, how do I go from daylight, minivan, to Mm. not knowing where I am, and it's night. So what happens after that? Somehow I managed to, I don't know this, but I I managed to push my hands, myself up with my hands far enough um, to get to like a, what was like a little pathway, Mm. um, because not far from that was the highway. Mm. And a lady that was driving at night, going back home, saw something and then she stopped. And luckily it, it was me. Mm. Then there were no cell phones, so she called the landline. Mm. Um, I had a, like a little thing, pouchy thing in my jean. Mm. You know, my mom always said, like, have your contact numbers mm. there. And my sister got the call. And because of the way where, we, where I was, she didn't want to wait for an ambulance. So mm. she literally transported me to the hospital. What, what state were you in that um, implied that you needed an ambulance? So I had blood. Mm. We didn't know exactly. So outside of the fact that I was half-dressed, so I was only wearing a top Mm. and nothing at the bottom. Mm. And I was just covered in blood from my head Mm. all the way down. So she was just panicking and Mm. I'm panicking. Now I'm panicking because I can see somebody, but I don't know what to say besides my headache and I'm I'm also just a mess. Mm. Yeah. So how did you get the contact numbers that you usually keep in your jeans? So not far. So obviously from where I crossed, she was traveling with somebody else. Mm. So in between the process of them deciding, this is now I'm finding afterwards, mm. they went and tried to look for more or less some of the stuff that they could find, like my shoes or, mm. yeah. Mm. Do you recall what you were wearing? Because mm-hmm. um, you say you just had a top on mm-hmm. and what state it was in. Do I remember what state my top was in? Mm. No, but I do know that I don't wear those colors anymore. Mm. Just, mm. I was wearing beige on that day. I don't wear beige. Is it because of that day? Yeah, there's a lot of things I don't do anymore because yeah. of that day, but I don't wear beige. Uh, I was wearing a beige top mm. and a jean mm. and beige shoes. When you were dragging yourself, mm. were you aware that you were half-dressed? Yeah. Mm. I th- uh, at, while feeling around... Mm. I I could feel, I touched myself and I could feel it. Okay. Mm. You, you said um, you knew something bad had happened. When did it dawn on you how bad it was? When I got to hospital. Okay. So you're with this good Samaritan. 
Yeah. And and you are so so fortunate because the times we live in now, we are afraid. You know, um, a good Samaritan comes. They phone the landline. What does uh, what is said to your sister? Do you speak to her or she speaks no, to her? No, I don't speak to my sister. I don't speak to anyone until I get to the hospital. Hmm. What um, did they But my say? sister tells me that they just said to her, look, something terrible has happened to your sister. We think she's been raped. We found her at such mm. a place. Where do you guys live? Mm. Then my, at that time, we were staying in Hillbrow. Mm. And we're like, okay, fine. Then we're going to bring her to the nearest hospital to there, mm. which was Johannesburg Hospital. Mm. And that's where they rushed me. And at that time, because obviously my sister was alone, my mom was out of the country, she called a few friends. Mm. And her first question was, where's so-and-so? Mm. And this lady's like, I don't know who you're talking about. I'm just telling you I found this person here. And mm. come to the hospital, we'll meet you there. When I got to the hospital, the police were already there with my sister as well. So you arrive at the hospital. And I mean, you still have a whole car ride did you eventually understand where it was that you were? Did they tell you where you were? She kept talking to me, yeah. She kept, mm. you know. Um, but a lot of that part of the car ride, I think I blocked out mm. personally. Mm. Mm. Uh, I have no distinct sort of recollection as to what I was thinking or going through. Mm. I think the only real thoughts and emotions I can tell are from the hospital because mm. that's when I'm also starting to piece I'm also just as equally surprised mm. as everybody because even when I got to hospital, my sister's like, what happened? Mm. What do you say? I don't know. Mm. Mm. So you get to the hospital, your sister is there, the police are there. What is the first thing that happens at the hospital? So uh, firstly, the nurses start attending to me. Mm. Um, <laughs> the, the, the first nurse that attended to me, she was... At, she uh, she started crying, mm. and then she saw me look at her. Wow! And then she stopped, and then she walked out. Mm. And another nurse came in, and they basically tried to clean me up so I could talk to the police and mm. explain what had happened. And they did that. I'm not saying anything at this point. Mm. Between shock and numbness, I could say. Mm. Um. Yeah, then the police come in. Then the nurses will come back after the police have spoken to you. Mm. They just needed to do like the most important thing, like clean me out of the blood, see where it was coming from. Mm. So a lot of it came from my head because mm. they had hit me over the head a couple of times, which we believe was uh, a stone, rocks. Mm. Um, and I had bruises on my thighs, obviously, as well. Mm. So they did a lot of that cleaning up and they bandaged me and the police came in. Ask me questions. Mm. When did they do the rape kit? Before or after talking to the police? After. Mm. Because mm. after the police left, I still sat a bit with the nurse mm. and the doctor. And that's when they had to explain what a rape kit is. Mm. Mm. Um, mm. They had to take me through the whole procedure of, you know, I need to come back mm. to test uh, twice for HIV to see mm. if I didn't get anything. Mm. Uh, pregnancy test, all of that. Mm. So... When you sat down with the police, what was that encounter like and, and what happened? It, it, it's strange to explain something you also don't have answers for, you mm. know, because the first question is, what happened? Mm. I said, I went to a bribe with so-and-so and this is what I remember and this is what happened. Where's so-and-so? I don't know. Mm. Um, yeah. And they took down my statement and then they assigned a detective to the case and mm. they left. The um, So the nurses now explain the rape kit mm -hmm. after the police are gone. Mm -hmm. um, them obviously explaining a rape kit, um, were they saying to you, we want to see if you have been raped or they had already decided no, they that, told me. that you have been raped? Yes, they told me. In fact, they told me immediately while they were cleaning me. Yes. The lady who was uh, cleaning me on my lower parts. Mm explain to me fully what had happened. What did she say? She said to me, I don't know if you know, but you were raped. Mm. And I said, okay. And she said to me, and the way it looks, it, it, it was like a vicious, mm. you know. Then she proceeded to ask me, do I know? And then I just broke down because I'm tired of answering a question I don't have answers to. Mm. 
How did you take her saying to you that you've been raped and it seems it was violent? At, honestly, while in hospital, I'm numb. Like, I couldn't even talk. I think even my sister tried to talk to me. One of my sister's friends tried to talk to me. I, I had nothing to say. Mm. Um, I, I remember crying, and, but I had nothing to say. Mm. I didn't know what to say. Mm. 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 It was a shock just as much as it was for everybody else. Mm. Because you were almost learning the facts as they were learning the facts. Yeah. Yeah. It would be different if I, the, the actual rape happened and I was conscious and they mm. took me. Mm. So um, the, the nurses told you what's happened. What did they explain the rape kit is for? Um, so what they explained the rape kit was for was it's to help me um, not get sick mm-hmm. if maybe whoever raped me had HIV mm. or whatever the case. Um, they also explained that it's to take a DNA mm-hmm. that would go towards the case because mm. um, they took swabs. Mm. Um, yeah, pretty, that's pretty much, mm. yeah. Mm. And, I mean, many women have said, obviously, the rape kit is invasive. Mm. Um and that's the first thing that you are recollecting mm. of this whole experience. Mm. Did you feel like it was a violation of sorts when it was happening, even though you understood why it needed to happen? The whole process after my rape was a violation. I yeah. felt victimized mm. all through the process. Mm. Um, you get to hospital and you can hear the nurses talking, you know, you you the way you get handled, mm. you know, Another nurse comes in, nurse ban ban. Hey, we born in a patient. Take a word, ban ban. Then they all, whoever changes shift is in there to check to see this this girl that had this thing happen to them. When they're doing the rape kit, it's spreading your legs, and it's it's another process altogether. That just. Hmm. What were some of the things you heard the nurses saying about you? Um, I think the one that really stuck. Hmm was I heard a nurse talk to another nurse and she was like, where, like, where was she, where was she going? You know, wow. why, why, like, why isn't this Ganja Zimfagala Bebayap? Wow. At that time, she doesn't even know my story. She doesn't even, she hasn't even taken five minutes to come sit next to me and talk to me. Mm. Mm. But she had already drawn some sort of a conclusion. Mm. 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 But the police that was actually, she was nice. Mm. I think she understood what was going on because she tried not to even pressure me with questions. Mm. And she was just like, look, we'll, the detective will come to your house, but just take it. But she was the nicest, I can think, mm. in, out of all the females that I met out of that situation. Mm. On that day. Mm. So after the rape kit, what was the next thing that needed to happen? So they wanted to keep me in hospital and I was, no. Oh. Mm. I asked my sister if, can we go home? And my sister was like, yes. Mm. And I went home. And, yeah, that, that, was, that was hard because, mind you, my sister's at that time, my sister's only two years older than me. Mm. And she has to now step into this role of trying to see how she helps me. Or The hospital said nothing about therapy or counselling. Mm. Um, so I just went home. And the first night I didn't sleep. I just sat on my floor and closed all the windows. And the only question on my mind was like, like why? Like, I, the only thing I wanted to know, I think for the first few days was, where's so-and-so and why? Why? Did your sister try and call, call her? At that point, we've, um, we were advised to just leave everything to the police. Mm. Um, and I think my sister wasn't so focused on that. She was more focused on me, mm. if anything. And, yeah. And then, then I didn't sleep that night. Kind of just sat through it. And then in the morning, um, a detective came. Mm. A detective that was assigned to my case. Mm. And funny enough, he lived down the road from me. Mm. So he never got tired. He was at my house every day mm. for like a month. Mm. So talk us through those um, days that came after and what were those days like for you? Because, I mean, 
you have your normal life, but that had to be on hold. I wouldn't say it had to be on hold. Mm. It stopped. I had to pick up a new life. Mm. Um, so the next day, the detective comes and he says, I'm detective so-and-so. I'll be doing your case. I'll be doing the investigation, all of mm. that. And he says, well, yesterday when I got your file, the first thing I did was to call the person you were traveling with to mm. find out, like, what happened. Mm. And uh, she told us that you passed out in the car on the way to the braai, mm. and then she left you in the car during the braai, mm. and then when she came back from the braai to the car, you weren't there. Mm. And then she went home. Mm. Mm. When the police called her, she was sleeping. Mm. So they said, how do you sleep when you went mm. somewhere with somebody and... Mm. I mean, I think to myself, I wouldn't be able to sleep if I went somewhere with somebody who's a female younger than me and they just disappear. And, mm. Yeah. And so that was day one with the detective. And I think that, that after our first sort of meeting with the detective, I had to sort of think about like so many things going through my mind. Mm. Later that afternoon, I got a call from... Um, the mother of the lady that I traveled with. Mm. And she said, how are you? I said, I'm obviously not okay. Mm. And she said to me, listen, I just wanted to tell you that what happened to you is very shameful. Um, this is something you should never mention to anyone ever again. I, I, when, I, when, when my sister said it was her on the phone, for some reason I thought... I thought she would say something comforting as a mother. So when she said that and I dropped the phone, I was like, okay, I shouldn't say anything to anyone. And that was my stance going forward. Yeah. <laughs> you chose that to be your stance because obviously somebody much older um, that you would consider a mother figure of sorts said to you, this is very shameful, don't talk about it. Did you ever go to your sister to tell her what was said to you? Yes, yes, yes. And what did your sister say? I think she was just shocked at that was said to me. Mm. And she was like, don't pay any mind. Mm. I think my sister was just equally traumatised. Mm. Equally traumatised by the whole thing. And at that time, I wasn't talking much. So I kind of went into a silence mm. um, for a couple of months. So I didn't do anything. I stopped going to school. I would lock myself up in the room. And no lights. I wouldn't bath. Nothing. I didn't want to talk. To the point that I stopped seeing the detective as well. I just got frustrated at looking. Because every time he'd come and give me feedback, I think maybe he was thinking it was good because it's showing progress. Mm. But he was just traumatizing me further. Mm. And then after about two, three weeks, I started getting flashbacks, like tiny flashbacks of the, like, of the incident. And then that was just, drove me up the wall. So I just stopped seeing anyone or talking to anyone. Describe what one of your flashbacks was like. What, what did you see? It, they're not clear. So it's like, have you ever been highly intoxicated? And then... You can't see th straight. Everything's moving. Mm. My flashback, it's, it's sort of like waking up and going back into sleep. But in that way, I see heads. Mm. I, I see partial act, but I, I, I can't tell you what's... Mm. I, can tell you, I can't tell you what's going on, but I can see these heads over me. Mm. And then it's almost like it's foggy, then I fall, go back into sleep again. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Did your flashbacks, because we've spoken about what you saw, did they have any other senses like certain smells or things, that textures that you felt, maybe things like that? So because I didn't do therapy earlier, like immediately after my rape, I didn't know that all those things were flashbacks. Mm. About a year after, well, not a year, but nine, a couple of months down the line, I had gone out to the supermarket and... 
I a smell, and I just went crazy because mm. it triggered a smell from that night. Mm. Mm. Yeah, but yeah. And when you say went crazy, what do you mean went crazy? My anxiety just mm. took over. Mm. So for a good year, year and a half, I couldn't go out in public. Normally, mm. I had an issue being around more than two, three people. Mm. I like I hate people standing behind me. Mm. I didn't like going. I, somebody walking up to me, trying to talk to me for me is just like a big no, no. Mm. Then, mm. Um, yeah, heavy anxiety. So I started screaming, um, and I was at the spa and I started screaming. And what's up? What's wrong with her? Mm. Mm. They had no idea. I started screaming. Yeah, I went mm. crazy. Somebody helped me. Like, where do you live? I told them and they walked me home. Mm. Next time on Unpacked. I was like, what if they decide to come back and finish what they started? You're a victim to such a horrific thing and you still keep getting victimized by other women. Don't give them the satisfaction of even robbing you of an education. That's the first time I felt validated by the death of my rapist. But I, I'm okay now. And there is life after rape. Mm. Thank you so much for watching Unpacked with Rilip Khilema. I want you to make sure you subscribe to my channel where you can get to watch more episodes. But more importantly, you can be part of our online community. Comment down below, share with us who you'd like to see on the show, what story you'd like us to discuss. We love engaging with you. Keep it coming and don't forget to subscribe.